morning, everybody. I, I just want to say there's been some awesome things happening here at Waves of Faith. Uh, last week, um, I know uh, Matt mentioned that we had our VBS, and it was just an awesome time. Like, there was just a bunch of kids. Um, there was a bunch of volunteers. That was the thing that just amazed us. There were so many people that volunteered. Awesome to see that. I'm not trying to call anybody out. Don't feel like I'm trying to make you feel bad for not going. But I, I'm really just excited of just what God is doing here at Waves of Faith. Um, you know, there's just so many things that are coming too. You know, God has us plugged in in a, all, a lot of these schools here in the community, and you can be a part of it too. And so don't feel, I don't want you to feel left out because there's many opportunities that will come that you will be able to serve. Um, so again, thank you to everybody who volunteered. Thank you to, uh, uh, most important, thank you to Aaron for just being uh, the head of that because we see, man, just... I don't know what it is. Like, I have kids myself, but whenever you see, like, the smiles on other kids who are not yours and just, like, how happy they are to be there just learning about God, it's just an awesome feeling that, like, I, I, I'll remember for the rest of my life. And so today, um, we will be looking at the story of Stephen. And um, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with this story. It's in the book of Acts. And uh, I, I'm I'm not one to ruin movies. I don't like when people ruin movies, but today I'm going to ruin this story for you. Um, I'm going to jump to the end, but Stephen is brutally murdered. Like, he is stoned to death. And so we are going to walk through his life and just see what led up to this, him being stoned. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever played a paper ball war before in your classrooms, um, but if you could just imagine playing that, but with rocks, this is, you know, I, I, I don't want to imagine it, but that's just how it is and what happened. And so we are going to walk through the life of Stephen this morning. And we are going to see the events that led up to his stoning and why he was even stoned in the first place. See, Stephen was chosen by the disciples See, the disciples, this is, uh, uh, this is right after uh, the, cruci- the resurrection of Christ, and the disciples are going out, and they are preaching the word of God, but they notice that they can't do it all alone, so they choose seven more apostles to go, and Stephen is one of those apostles. And this is what it says about Stephen. It says, he was a man full of the spirit and of wisdom. I don't know about you, but I would love for somebody, if they talk about me, I mean, I'm not sure if I have any haters or anything. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. All right, somebody says bad things about you, right? Uh, Maybe, I mean, for some reason, and it's funny, like, uh, I always get flipped off, like, on the freeway. Uh, Thomas was there, uh, one of my buddies was there here for one of them. And so, yes, there's some people that don't like you, but the people that do know me, I hope that they would say that I am a man full of the spirit and full of wisdom. And I hope that, you know, when I'm gone, that's what's remembered about me. Not anything that I've done, but that, you know, I was serving God. And so this is what is said about Stephen. And like I mentioned earlier, today we are going to look at the last days of his ministry and of his life. He is the first ever recorded martyr. If you're not sure what a martyr is, it's somebody who is killed for their faith. You hear about missionaries who go to these uh, countries where Christianity is not accepted and they have these underground churches like in China or in Afghanistan or in other places across the world. And when they are caught preaching the word of God, most of the times they are killed. And this is what happened to Stephen. So as I mentioned earlier in Acts 6, 5, it says he was a man full of the spirit and of wisdom. See, the first thing that we can learn about Stephen's life that we can apply to our own lives is that we must be faithful to God. In order for these things to be said about you, you would have to be a faithful servant of God. And so this is the first thing that we learn and the first words that we learn about Stephen's life is that he is a faithful man of God. And if you can apply this to your life, I would write this down and just say, be faithful to God, right? It's easier said than done. We say it time and time again up here, how you need to be faithful to God, but church, we really need to be faithful to God. We have to understand what it means to walk in the spirit and be full of wisdom. And Stephen shows us that. 
in Acts 6. We're going to open up our Bibles this morning. So if you do have your Bible, if you want to follow along in the Bible app, I would encourage you. And if you are taking notes um, this morning, I would ask that you just highlight anything that God speaks to you this morning. We are going to start in Acts 6, uh, verse 8. Here's some more awesome things said about Stephen. I don't know about you, but I wish Stephen was my friend. Because when it, the things that are just said about him in the Bible are just amazing things. Right? right here it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. So like I said, those who are disputing with Stephen are not okay with him preaching the gospel. And so what happens? It says they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So what do they do? Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. I want you to notice something here. And if you want to highlight this in your Bible or in your notes, notice how they didn't say he was speaking against Jesus and God. No, he was speaking against Moses and God. Thank you. Why, why would they say that? Well, because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so this is why they are calling him out. And they are trying to instigate other people to go against him. Has that ever happened to you? Are you that person that instigates fights? I'm sorry, but I am, right? When I see my little nephews fighting, I'm like, oh, I bet you won't hit them again. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I was and how I still am a little bit today. I mean, when my, my boys are fighting, I'm like, I bet you won't slap them. <laughs> I bet you won't. And then they start going at it, and I'm just, like, amazed by what they're doing. And I'm like, all right, stop, right? I got to stop it. Well, this is what they're doing against Stephen. They're trying to find wrong things about him. They're trying to accuse him of certain things. And I will say the things that they are accusing him of are not blasphemous, but they are the truth. He is saying that Jesus is the Messiah, and he is saying that Jesus came and fulfilled the law. So these are, although they are false, uh, false things that they're trying to uh, do against him, they are, they are also true. Verse 12, it says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. So now they're bringing more people to, to go against Stephen. He's almost getting jumped, if you would say, at this point. And they come upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. There's two things to, to note here about Stephen and what they're not okay with. The first thing is Stephen speaking against the holy place. Why was this important? Well, because at this time, right, these leaders believed that this temple was the, the place, the dwelling place of God, and where everybody would come to meet God. And so when Jesus came, if, if you go to John chapter 2, verse 19, he says this, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Jesus is here talking about himself, him being the true temple, him being the way, the truth, and the life. And they were not okay with this. It's almost like they were trying to confine God into a certain space. Why? Because if you ask me, I think it's easier. Right? Isn't it easy just to show up on Sunday, not talk to anybody, and then leave and not have anybody worry about what you're doing? It's easy just to show up Sunday after Sunday and not serve anywhere, not want to volunteer anywhere. Why? Because you don't want anybody to know what is going on with you. And so when Jesus was walking the earth and he was calling out these leaders, they were not okay with it because many times if you look in the gospel, he challenged, they challenged him. And time and time again, Jesus simply just used the word of God 
to just prove them wrong and flipped it most of the times on them. The second thing they were not okay with is Stephen proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. They were not okay with this. I mean, you think about it, these are some of the same religious leaders who had just put Jesus on the cross. So obviously anybody who is speaking and proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, they are not okay with. See, it says, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we had heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs delivered to us. So what do you think Stephen does, right? Stephen is now, he is basically seized, he is challenged, he is put before a judge and the council. If you ask me what I would do in this situation, because I've been to court many times, um, I let my lawyer talk for me, right? I let somebody else talk for me because I probably would get myself uh, put into a little bit more trouble. But Stephen, remember, he is a man full of wisdom and full of the Spirit. So he understands the words that he is about to say. Not only that, you have to understand this, is that anybody at this time who was speaking blasphemous against the law and against God was to be put to death. So Stephen knew that whatever his next words were going to be had to be either, he, he had a choice. He was either going to go against God's word or he was going, going to go against the council and those sitting around or those charging him for these blasphemous things. I want to turn your attention to the scripture in 1 Peter 3.15. It says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Repeat that after me. Gentleness and respect. All right, we got that down, right? Y'all saw it. I'm not, I didn't add this, right? I didn't add this to the word. This is in the word. See, what this scripture is telling us is that we have to be ready to defend our faith. And so Stephen here is ready to defend his faith. See, this scripture isn't enabling us to get in fights on Facebook or Twitter comments with other people. See, I have this, <laughs> I'm going to give you a story about a time that I defended my faith, so I thought. The reason I say that is because I was, uh, I was working at Whataburger at this time. Um, I love that job. I don't know why. I, I never get tired of Whataburger. I love it. And I was, I was working the evening shift. Um, I was already graduated. I had already given my life to Christ. I had already been baptized. And I was trying to find my way through adulthood just like any other 18, 19, 20-year-old, maybe some 25, right? You go that far, it's okay. Trying to find my way around adulthood. And I started falling back into the same things I was doing in high school. So in high school, um, it's funny because I think about this, right? You have to be 21 to drink, but I was like 16, 17, like doing beer runs and, and all that stuff. And I was getting back into that way again. And I was going um, after work to drink with a couple of friends. And this specific time, um, it was a bunch of us. We were, it was after work. It was probably like 11 o'clock at night. Um, you know, we're all there. We're having a kickback. That's what we used to call it back then. Um, you know, it's not a party, but it's just a, a gathering of a couple of people. Over 10, I would say, is a party. But yeah, it was a, at least under 10 of us. And uh, one of the friends, who, my friends whose house we were at, he invites one of his friends that I, I, I don't know this guy. Like, I, nobody knows who this guy is. Obviously, he knows who he is. He starts drinking with us. He gets drunk very quick. And just out of nowhere, he starts saying these remarks. And you can fill in the blanks where you want to. But he's like, forget God. God is fake. God is not real. Forget anybody who thinks God is real. And I'm sitting there with a beer in my hand, getting upset. And I'm like, okay, like, like, why is he saying this? Like, he doesn't know. Like, and I just look at the person next to me. I'm like, I'm about to tell this dude something because he's really making me mad. So I get up and I'm like, forget you. 
Everything that you say, God is real. And then he gets in my face and he just starts going and we start getting in, like, we're, like he just keeps going on without it and I'm not even telling them, like I'm going at him now, not even about what he was saying about God and he's just laughing. Like honestly, I don't know if this guy was possessed or not. I really don't. And then we get into a shoving match and I'm not gonna lie, like I don't, like I'm not the person that ever, you know that those people that always explain like that they're winning this fight. Like I don't know if I was like winning this shoving match or not. Like, I, I felt like I wasn't. I can't remember, but um, I'm not much of a fighter, so I don't know. But what I was doing, you know, I, I come back, like, you know, they separate us. I go back home. I, I wake up the next morning with the headache, of course, and I think I'm like, man, like, what did I just do? Like, did I make a fool of myself? Should I have just let this guy be and say the things he was saying? Maybe I did the right thing, I don't know, but if you ask me, I feel like I didn't, because I feel like I just acted out of anger. I was not in a position to defend my faith. What I could have done is been like, hey, bro, like I heard, like I could have asked for his number later on and been like, hey, like I heard the words that you said. Um, I know somebody in the church that probably you could talk to. I go to a church. Maybe I could have done that, but no, I decided to take matters into my own hands. And like I mentioned earlier, this scripture here is telling us that we must honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, not like me, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet doing it with gentleness and respect. Those are some key words because like I said, I mean, there's a lot of us, even though, you know, I mean, let's be real. I mean, we're, we're on Facebook. And although we might not say something, but we share something, right? We share the things because we know our theas and our theos who are not okay with the things that we share, and we're ready there waiting for them to comment, or we're ready for them to, to tweet this tweet so that we can go back and forth with them. But that's not what Stephen here is going to show us. No, he's going to show us how to do this with gentleness and respect. See, Stephen's response begins in Acts 7, 1 through 43. And I want to encourage you because we're just going to summarize these verses. I want to encourage you to go home and read these verses. Here's why. Because what Stephen does is he walks through the Old Testament. Beginning with Abraham to, to Moses, he, he talks about Joseph. So if you don't know anything about the Old Testament, you can go to this scripture in Acts 7, 1 through 43, and you can learn a little bit of the history of what happens in Genesis leading up to Exodus and a little bit um, further on. And Stephen makes a response. He defends his faith, right? They ask him, it says, um, do you have anything to say? And Stephen's like, yes, I do. And he begins with the sermon. He starts preaching to them. And what he does is he shows them, right, because what they believe is that Jesus is not Lord and that they're holding this temple so sacred that he's talking about. And so they're falsely accusing him of certain things. And so he walks them through the Old Testament. And he doesn't just do it out of anger or anything, but he shows them God's word. And he shows them the stories in the Bible and how God time and time again showed up, not in just a place, but showed up to these, these um, prophets in the time that they, he needed to show up, show up. See, he also tell, shows them how time and time again they reject God's people. You think about Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his own brothers. You think about Moses when he took the Israelites out of slavery and they tell him, man, it would have just been better if you just left us there. And so Stephen is walking them through that, trying to help them understand what he is trying to say and to show them. And in these next verses, we will see how Stephen tries to get them to understand that God does not just dwell in this temple that they have made sacred. In Acts 7, Verse 44, it says this, Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it, in, brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God, asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it wasn't till Solomon who built the house for him. So God did instruct them to make the temple, but he didn't instruct them to make it an idol. 
And here in verse 48, he says, Yet the Most High God does not dwell in the houses made by hands, as the prophet says. This is from Isaiah. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is this place of rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And so Stephen uses scripture here to help them to understand that God does not just reside in this, in this place that they think. But know that heaven is his throne and the earth is just his footstool. See, in any scripture that I read, I always ask God, is Steve, like like here in this specific scripture, I'm like, is Stephen talking to me? Have I made, right, this is the house of the Lord. We're in the house of the Lord this morning, right? But have I made this an idol to where this is the only place that I seek God? Church, I want to ask you. Is this the only place you come to seek God? That is not a wrong thing I'm trying to say. Yes, we seek God here, but is this the only place? See, our, this church, we don't want it to be this sacred place that you look at where, you you know, it's just like, oh, no, like, I got to take off my hat. No, like, we want you to be seeking God outside of these four walls. We want you to go home and apply these scriptures to your life. See, and that's what Stephen here was trying to help them understand. But Stephen also knows that he's most likely going to be rejected. Why? Because he tells them how they have rejected their fathers before that. In verse 51, he says this, and and this is where you might not think this is respectful, but I feel like Stephen did this in the most respectful way that anybody can. He says this in verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. They're talking about Jesus. So now he's going at them and telling them like, hey, in history, your fathers before that have rejected the coming one. You've rejected the prophets. Not only that, you rejected the Messiah to the point where you guys murdered him. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you you who received the law as delivered by angels And did not keep it. Man, he hit them right in the heart this time. Because these leaders were all about keeping the law. That's what their whole life revolved around, about them keeping the law of Moses. And so when he tells them this, I could just imagine, like, you know when somebody tells you something and your face is just like, I can't believe they just said that. Right? Have you ever been sitting, I mean, I've sat in these seats. And I'm like, how does the, the person who's speaking up there know what I'm going through? How do they know? Like, how do they know what I am going through? And see, the second thing we can do like Stephen is be bold. See, Stephen knows he's facing certain death, but guess what? That did not stop him from preaching the word of God. That did not stop him from going on in front of the council to show them in a respectful way, defending his faith, how time and time again, how Jesus is the Messiah and that God does not just dwell in this temple. So now we hear from the response from the leaders, from those that are sitting there. This is their response. Acts 7, verse 54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. In some translation, it says they gnashed their teeth at him. So they were not okay. Like some of these people must have been convicted to the point where they were like, man, like this dude just called us out. Like he just totally just went against everything that we said. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen, although he knows what's coming, he continues to look and he looks into heaven and he acknowledges God for who he is. 
This is similar if, uh, to, to when Jesus was on the cross and he looks up into heaven. It says, but they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. See, this is, I mean, the way it talks about it here, I mean, yes, it says they stoned him, but I mean, I, I can't imagine what this scene looked like. I mean, for me, I kind of think about, you know, when there's riots and things like that and things are being thrown everywhere and people are just getting hurt and people are just, you know, this is just a gruesome side that's happening and these people are okay with it. Nobody's stopping this. And the witness and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not, I repeat, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a lot that just went on right there. See, Stephen, in the middle of persecution, is being stoned, calls out to heaven, acknowledges God for who he is, but he doesn't stop there. He calls out in, in, to God again, and he says, God, do not hold this sin against them. The same people who are persecuting him, the same people who are stoning him, he's asked for forgiveness for them. See, the, the third thing we can learn about Stephen's life is that we need to be gracious. See, although Stephen was persecuted and stoned to death, that did not stop him from praying for those around him. And see, in this world today, church, I don't know if you're, if you're not on the, the news and, and just everything that is going on. Like, it's, it's almost like everything. Christianity is just being taken out of everything. And daily, it, even here in the United States where we have this freedom, we are being persecuted. But that should not stop us from being gracious to people. You may have somebody in your life who you once persecuted. I know I did. And guess what? That very same person who I persecuted was the person that was praying for me the most. And that was my mom. And, I mean, I didn't go at her for being a believer, but I, I put her through, I mean, sorry. I put her through a, a, a many things that, uh, like, a, like, I'm not proud of to this day. I, I, I can't repay that. But you know what? She didn't stop praying for me. Maybe there's somebody in your life who's just constantly, maybe it's at your workspace, maybe it's, at, you know, at your schools or in, 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 you know, your own family who are just constantly coming at you for coming to church. And I would encourage you that you pray for them. Because I've sat there, even amongst family, and I have heard some things that I'm like, man, I just want to say something. But you know what? The best thing is sometimes I just keep my mouth closed and I'm like, you know what? I just need to pray for them. And I don't know if you caught this earlier, but it says this, and going back to verse 58, it says, then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So I don't know if you know who Saul is, but Saul it's, this is Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul. So Stephen, crying out to God, prays for the people around him. Paul is standing in that crowd. And later on, what does God do? Paul is headed to Damascus, and on that road, he meets him. He blinds him. See, all that Stephen was preaching about keeping this holy place God meets Paul, who is this religious leader who believes just like these leaders that the, that the temple is this sacred place. God meets him on the road to Damascus. And later on, Paul 
becomes the writer of a lot of the books in the New Testament. And here's this to say that first, you probably, ne- like whenever you're praying, you probably, you, you probably never know who's in the crowd. You never know who you're praying for sometimes. I mean, I'm sure there's people that prayed for me. But second, I want to tell you this, because Paul he was, or Saul, he was not the best of people. Obviously, he was here at this execution, but he was also in the crowd out of a lot of more executions. See, he was killing Christians, persecuting them, and God still used him. See, in this Summer Jam series that we have uh, been doing, there have been testimonies I mean, you hear a, a, a testimony of Gustavo, who was here a couple of weeks ago, who, how God used him even whenever he wasn't ready. He was standing, and he, there was somebody else who was called to, to preach a sermon that day, and God chose him and used him. You have Ali, who in his household, Jesus is not accepted, and God still used him and is using him today. Church, you, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what you are doing, there's somebody praying for you. I will say that if you are in here today, I know there's somebody praying for you. And God can use you. I don't want you to think that anything that you have done will hold you back because it won't. Paul is the example of that. And Stephen is the example of the person that we should be. You know why? Because Stephen followed the example of Jesus Christ. Stephen followed the example of Jesus Christ in his life because guess what? He was preaching the gospel and he got persecuted even to the point of death. See, I don't know about you, but I've been thinking a lot about death lately. And I ask myself, God, am I willing to lay down my life for you? And I say yes. No matter what the cost is. See, I'm not talking about just a physical death, but I'm talking about a death to myself, to, to the things that I want to be, to the things that I want to do, my personal, my goals and my things. But no, I, I, wanna, I ask God every day, God, make me less of me and more of you, God. Use me as your mouthpiece. No matter how not confident I am, no matter how, what I think about myself, God, use me. And he can use you too. And I want to encourage you with that, church. Because God is, even when we don't deserve it, Sonny talked about this last week, even when we don't deserve it, he still sent his son to die for us. And if you are in that place this morning where you feel like you cannot be used by God, I just want to ask that you close your eyes and you ask God at this moment, God, use me. No matter what my job situation is, no matter what my financial situation is, no matter what my status at work is, no matter if people, what people would think about me, God, use me. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done. Lord, we, we sang it in your song earlier, Lord, all that you have done for us, Father God. Lord, we we thank you. Use us, God, no matter what the cost is, no matter how far you take us, Lord. Lord, you lead the way. Lord, we thank you for for giving us great examples in the Bible of the people that you use and even the people that you use to use other people, God. We thank you. Father, if there's anybody this morning who does not know who you are, Lord, I pray that they not be afraid, but they understand, Lord, that all they have to do is just call out to you, God. You have already forgiven them for what they have done, but I pray that they understand, Lord, that they they do not need to walk in this guilt or this shame, Father, but you have just cleared all that away so that we can follow you. And one day, one day, We will be with you, Lord. We thank you. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen.